This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so I left, uh, I left plenty of time at the end uh, for this talk, as I imagine people have thoughts, uh, comments, questions. Uh, so I look forward uh, to the discussion. So I don't have any um, uh, disclosures uh, to speak of except for uh, research funding um, that's related to uh, the content, particularly the first project is related to the content that I'll cover today. Um, and, and I will say I'm going to talk about uh, this topic of discussing out-of-pocket costs is something I've been thinking about for some time, have done some work on, and uh, are begin we're beginning to do qu quite a lot of work with this, uh, with this project that's been funded recently. So. Um, to say money matters isn't anything that is new to anyone in the room. Um, I think this is a, a nice slide. This is from a perspective piece that Peter Eubel and some colleagues wrote uh, quoting CDC data. Uh, I'll just call your attention to the sort of right side of each one. The, the panel A is people under 65. Panel B is people over 65. And you can look and see that essentially an appreciable, appreciable portion of, of folks in the US, whether they're covered by private insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, or Medicare only, um, uh, or uninsured, all have uh, financial burdens associated with medical care. The, the uh, bars over to the left just break that down into different kinds of burdens. But I think it's important, and all of us uh, uh, probably know, that this is not a trivial issue. This concept of financial toxicity is, a, is one that I think is a really nice term um, and, and really refers to the notion of financial side effects, right? There are financial implications of people's lives that can result from costs associated with different forms of medical care. Um, and as Peter and colleagues have nicely pointed out, we have a funny disconnect between how we think about describing medical toxicities and the fact that we often don't talk about financial toxicities, despite the fact that they can imp impact people's lives in important ways. Right, so how do we treat financial toxicity as a whole? Probably not very well. Uh, cost is pretty rarely discussed in outpatient encounters. There's a few studies that have looked at recorded conversations of physicians in different kinds of contexts, uh, and basically less than 20% of encounters actually talk about out-of-pocket costs. Um, and conversations, when they've, when they've analyzed the way that these things tend to take place, can break down in lots of ways that all of us, I think, can relate to. So one, sometimes patients raise uh, concerns without that being really recognized by a clinician. Uh, sometimes we dismiss financial concerns or don't really engage with them in any detail when they're raised. And often we don't resolve them very effectively. We might say, well, oh, you have insurance coverage and assume that will take care of it when it doesn't. There may be drug assistance programs and it doesn't take care of the whole cost. We may just write a prescription and say, let us know if you have problems when you get uh, to the pharmacy, and that probably doesn't really address them either. Um, I don't mean to say it's easy. This is incredibly difficult, right? So patient-specific information about drug costs is almost always not available. You have no idea what an individual patient's copay is going to be when you write a prescription. It's awkward and time consuming to talk about cost. This is not a simple issue to address. Um, but I think the important thing is we can sometimes make pretty good guesses about medical benefits and risks and what they're likely to mean to patients. I think we have no idea what uh, money means to the patient in front of us. Sometimes you have a good idea, but sometimes you really don't. And if we're not talking about uh, the impact of costs with patients, we really can't incorporate that into judgments. <clears throat> this is just a slide uh, to show uh, what I think is obvious, that we deal with these things in cardiology, right? The big ticket item in recent uh, years uh, is probably PCS PCSK9 inhibitors, just because of the sheer cost associated uh, with that therapy. But we see it in heart failure with Evabradine and Zucubitril Valsartan. Certainly we see it with anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents, direct oral anti uh, anticoagulants and novel PTY12 inhibitors. Um, and if that's not uh, complicated enough, our patients have a lot of comorbidities, which are also associated with some big ticket item drugs, certainly diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases. Many of these things are associated with appreciable out-of-pocket costs. This is something that's getting some airplay right now. 
Um, and some of you may have seen this. The ACC released a statement um, uh, last week in support of this effort. So um, uh, HHS Secretary Alex Azar has recently announced a requirement that uh, essentially out-of-pocket costs or I should say um, wholesale acquisition costs or the list price of a drug has to be listed um, at the end of direct-to-consumer advertising. Um, and, and this quote from him, I think, is in many ways hard to disagree with, right? You ought to know how much a drug costs and how much it's going to cost you long before you get to the pharmacy counter or get the bill in the mail. This obviously is a relatively uncontroversial statement in some ways, but the devil is certainly in the details, right? So this is what's coming, right? You can imagine this is, this is one of the more controversial and Tresto ads. Uh, that showed um, that had very ominous music and people drowning in a flood, um, uh, and then at the end of the month or at the end of the ad, you can imagine, well, that's three hundred eighty dollars a month, unless it's different, right? Because three hundred eighty dollars a month is the list price of the drug, but that may have nothing to do with what an individual patient will pay. I would call your attention. There's a there's a nice perspective piece in this week's New England Journal by Michelle Mallow at Stanford and uh, and a colleague. Um, that goes through this, this policy and sort of thinks about some of the unintended consequences and legal challenges. But obviously, one of the biggest issues is just that the uh, wholesale acquisition costs may have no relationship to what an individual patient will pay. And this lists the top 10 uh, branded drugs um, in terms of advertisement expenditures in 2017. And a couple of drugs, particularly Pixaban and Rivaroxaban, ones that we know well, you can look in the wholesale acquisition costs is pretty similar to the second column, which is what people would pay if they paid cash for their drugs. Um, but it has nothing to do um, with uh, the amount per month that Medicare beneficiaries pay. So this is uh, a potentially misleading piece of information. At, at least uh, it's hard to know what to do with it. There's other challenges too, right? So Michelle and her colleagues uh, raise real questions about whether people will potentially be dissuaded um, from asking their doctors about drugs that are potentially appropriate for them um, and actually may turn out to be affordable just based on the fact that they hear uh, a retail price that's high. The flip side is people may think, um, and I'll give you some data on this uh, in a little bit, they may think that a high drug cost must mean it's really awesome. Um, and so that's the one that you need to ask your patient, uh, your doctor about. There's huge questions about how the cost will be communicated, um, what the format is, whether it's just buried in the other disclosures at the end, um, and certainly how the rule will be enforced. And there are interesting legal challenges about uh, compelled disclosure. So this is uh, something that is evolving uh, and will be interesting to see how it happens. I raise it mostly as a way of introducing the fact that this is a hot issue um, and that incorporating cost is complex. I think this is a great uh, this, this sort of approach to, to mentioning costs at the end of an ad is a really good example of just looking at the tip of the iceberg, right? If we think about why this is hard, uh, we have, as we mentioned, incomplete information in most cases, varying medical benefits of different drugs, really difficult challenges communicating risk and benefit, complex trade-offs between big deal outcomes and cost, patients that have different values with regard to their money as well as medical outcomes, other kinds of expenditures we often don't know about, and really interesting challenges with regard to unintended uses of information. So some of these challenges are what we'll talk about today. So what I uh, want to hopefully uh, uh, cover in this and, and, and hopefully convince you um, that uh, the importance of understanding how out-of-pocket costs make uh, otherwise clear medication choices preference sensitive, and by preference sensitive, I mean it's subject to values that people hold and may not be the same across the population. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing, um, identifying challenges in talking with patients about out-of-pocket costs, and I'll describe some work we've been doing in the heart failure setting with regard to patients' perspectives on trade-offs between out-of-pocket costs and medical benefit. What I'm not going to address, and I think this is important because often people will ask questions about this. Um, are policy level decisions about the value of particular therapies or about payer coverage decisions. We're not going to talk about cost effectiveness analysis, right? It's a very different process and very different thing than it is to talk with patients about what it's worth to them to pay their out-of-pocket costs. 
Uh, I won't talk about the merits of drug assistance programs, other than the fact that I think it's important to recognize that is an, mentioning drug assistance programs is obviously an important part of talking with patients about costs at a policy level, whether those programs are good efforts or whether they just prop up drug costs is a whole separate uh, topic. I won't talk about drug pricing strategy, and we're not going to cover non-medication costs, despite the fact that those can often have somewhat similar dynamics. So just as a, uh, to, to sort of get this off the ground, I think it's hard, uh, probably hard to dispute, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear that cost does affect care in some ways, and we're understanding the scope of this in, in, in different contexts. This is just one example in the space of antiplatelet therapy. This was a nice piece published in JAMA Internal Medicine looking, looking at essentially um, the uh, extent to which people were filling drugs um, uh, at 6 and 12 months after PCI with drug-eluting stents. And you can see if you just look across the column, this is the, the essentially the possession ratio, so the, the amount of time that people uh, had the drug that they were prescribed. And as you look, it's definitely lower for prasugril and ticagrelor than it is for clopidogrel. And if you look um, in the bottom two, it just describes the copayment per six month and 12 months. Um, and you can see that the copayments are certainly different uh, between these drugs. There's also a bigger uh, range of copayments for ticagrelor and prasugril than there is for uh, clopidogrel. This is just a follow-up to show uh, something which I think is really important, um, and, and our data shows some of this as well, that as you look, this is, this is, these are sort of population level data, so they don't have individual income, but if you look at people's zip code and do an income analysis, you can see essentially that across all categories of zip code related, or zip code based income assessment, across all categories, the medication possession ratio is lower for newer agents than it is for clopidogrel. And I think this is just a demonstration uh, of, of uh, the fact that um, you know, one, pl one plausible explanation for that is the cost associated um, with these medications. We also know cost matters to patients, right? How would it not matter to people? In every other context where we interact with a professional, uh, we usually ask how much it costs, and we usually factor that into a decision about whether we're going to do it or not. Um, we don't have uh, uh, great data about exactly how people do and don't think about costs for medical situations differently, um, but it's hard to imagine how this wouldn't be important. So in that context, many people will propose the idea that what we need to do is share in decision making, right? Share decision making incorporates respect for people's autonomy. It encourages us to appreciate both our expertise and patients' expertise um, in what, uh, uh, particularly with regard to their values. Shared decision making is classically felt to be important in the context of preference sensitive decisions, so some, ones where people are uh, plausibly likely to have different values that would affect the decision they make. And it's become kind of the fallback solution uh, when the answer is not clear. It's also the most mom and apple pie concept on the face of the earth, right? How could you not uh, embrace the concept of sharing decisions with patients? The problem is it's really hard to do, as we all know, right? So when we think about trying to share decisions in the context of cost, we've mentioned some of these barriers, um, but just to kind of go through a bit of it again, first, effective sharing of decision requires data. We often don't have data about how much someone would, would pay for a medicine. It requires integrating different types of data, right? Costs, medical benefit, risks, and side effects. Cost, unfortunately, has been systematically excluded from most efforts to try to promote shared decision making, whether it's because of political sensitivities or because of the fact that every patient's cost is different. Most decision aids, for example, that have, have proliferated in recent years systematically ignore cost. Um, and each piece of information, the risk, the benefits, the cost, all of those things can be communicated differently. We'll talk a little bit about the ways some of those can, uh, that affects people's uh, impressions. Um, and patients have really different expectations about their own role and their clinician's role in making decisions, especially about talking about money. So this, I think, is a really nice study. Some of you have seen me present these data before, but it's one of those studies I just think um, uh, is worth uh, repeating. 
So this is now more than 35 years old, um, and a group basically randomized patients, graduate students, and physicians to different presentations of radiation versus surgical treatment for lung cancer. This was a well-done study. Everyone received uh, information that was accurate and, and what, by all accounts, was complete. Uh, and essentially, people got randomized on a few different um, uh, uh, factors of the presentation. And we'll talk about just the first of these. And that's whether things were presented in terms of their chance of survival versus their chance of death. They also got randomized on cumulative events versus life expectancy and then whether the treatments were actually named. Um, they included tables, descriptions, all that to say this was thorough. It was what you would expect patients uh, would receive. And I'll just give you an example. This is all about how important it is with regard to how, how important it is how we actually uh, frame decisions. So this is an example of framing this in terms of dying. Of 100 people having surgery, 10 will die during treatment, 32 will die by one year, and 66 will have died by five years. Of 100 people having radiation therapy, none will die during treatment, 23 will die by one year, and 78 will die by five years, okay? Same information with the living frame. Of 100 people having surgery, 90 will survive treatment, 68 will be alive at one year, 34 will be alive at five years. Of 100 people having radiation therapy, all will survive treatment, 77 will be alive at one year, and 22 will be alive at five years. So exact same information, just framed the opposite way. This, I think, is just astounding, though. So this essentially shows the percentage of people choosing radiation therapy by assignment to the living or dying frame. And you can see that across all categories, more people would choose radiation when framed in terms of dying as opposed to framed in framing in terms of living. And what is perhaps most striking is the fact that physicians were as much or more sensitive to this than the other two groups that were studied. So I think this just shows a profound impact in how we describe these things. So if we start to think about integrating cost, that gets to be a really interesting challenge. Tracy Wong talked about this last week in her grand rounds, which I thought were really excellent um, with regard to studies that they had done um, within the Palm Registry. So they'd taken people and given them different presentations in terms of their risk of cardiovascular events in the context of hyperlipidemia. And it's not worth looking at the, 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 the details are not, uh, uh, of the pictures are not important, except that one of the things they looked at was what tools you use to describe this. There's been a lot of move towards these pictographs that you can see with the smiley faces and frowny faces and these kinds of things. And they looked, and you can see that the impact of using the pictograph versus a bar graph um, was appreciable, right? So across the different ways that they presented risk information in terms of whether it was framed as 10-year risk, death risk, or lifetime risk, it seemed to have people, fewer people appreciated or called themselves high risk when, when exposed to the pictogram on the right than when they saw something like the bar graph or just words, which I think is really interesting. More importantly, they looked at whether or not they described people's risk in terms of their lifetime risk whether they describe their 10-year cardiovascular disease risk or their death risk uh, over a 10-year period. And you can see important differences with whether people thought they were high risk or not based on which frame was used, right? That also correlated when they asked whether people would be likely to take medication. Um, they were more likely to be willing to take medications, you can see, when given lifetime risk as opposed to death risk because the numbers were lower. So I think this raises a really interesting question, and I raise this because we have to think about this when we integrate cost information, right? So the question is, which one do you use? So what do you guys think? So, so how, many, how many in the room would choose lifetime risks if the choice was whether or not uh, to give a patient a statin? So most people in the room. What about for a PCSK9 inhibitor? All right, no hands up, right? So, well, Larry's uncertain. <laughs> I'm not sure we have lifetime risk to apply to that. Okay. F fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the, the point, though, is that one of the motivations is that you think a patient ought to take a statin in this case, right? It's a cheap medicine. We have good data to show uh, that it's beneficial. 
PCSK9, certainly the benefits um, are being elucidated, as Larry mentioned. We don't have the same kind of data. The costs are also radically different. And the studies that we've seen, the impact is there, but it's not overwhelming. Um, and so you may choose a different frame of presenting this information based on the choice that patients are likely to make, are, are being asked to make. This is another, I think, really interesting case of where people have what I would call paradoxical reactions uh, to information about costs. And this is a study done by Larry Allen and Dan Matlock's group at the University of Colorado using an online sample where they essentially randomized people to hearing about a VAD with or without the fact that the price tag for a VAD over the first year is about $300,000. And you can see, interestingly, when people were randomized to hear the cost, they were more likely to want a VAD than when they didn't hear the cost. And essentially, the, the top two bars are when they made the decision for themselves. The bottom two bars are when they made the decision for someone else. Again, this is not an overwhelming effect, but you see a consistent increase in likelihood of accepting a therapy when you do hear the costs, despite the fact that I think many people think if people hear costs are appreciable, they're going to contextualize it the other direction, right? So people don't always use information in the ways that we think they might. I will, I, I should say, I, I told him I wouldn't put him in the slide, but um, my nine-year-old son, yesterday when I was sort of going through some of these slides, he said, what is, what is that, Dad? Is that like a slideshow? And I said, yeah. Uh, and I said, I'm talking with um, some doctors about the cost of medicines. And he's like, and, and I said, so Henry, if, if I gave you a choice between the medicine that was 50 bucks a month and a medicine that was 10 bucks a month, which one would you take? Well, I'd take the 50 one. That must be better. <laughs> right? So, so this is, my nine-year-old is probably reflective of a lot of the population. And this is not a new story, right? There's great data on, so some folks have tried to look at the impact of conflict of interest disclosures. And it turns out that if you're a patient and your physician discloses lots of conflicts of, conflicts of interest, they're going to think you're a really good doctor because it means a lot of people are paying you for what you think. My mother's that way. My mother goes to see this doctor. She's like, oh, he speaks all over the place for these companies because they really value his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, it's fine, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean what you're thinking it means. That whether it's problematic or not is a whole separate issue. Um, but people don't use information the way that we sometimes think that they might. The other problem, of course, is that sometimes when we try really hard to be conscious of communicating things clearly, people don't always take it up in the way that we think. And this is one of my favorite studies from the critical care setting where essentially a bunch of people got presented with these different kinds of qualitative statements and asked what people's chance of survival is. And you can see there's a lot of overlap between I am concerned he will not survive and it is possible he will not just survive, and at the bottom he has a 5% chance of surviving. Right? Those feel like very different statements, but the error bars uh, overlap substantially. So as much as we sort of try to be targeted, I think it's important to recognize, and we all know this, that. Uh, people may not take away what we're, what we're trying to say. So I want to focus now on some of the work that we've been doing, most of which is related to Secubitril Valsartan, because I think it's a really great case for exploring a lot of these issues and is something that's really um, important in today's practice. So this just shows data from the Paradigm HF study, which most of you say it's zoomed out for a reason, um, which is essentially in all the, you know, the major components of the primary outcome, as well as death from any cause, you see a clear separation of the curves. You also see that the magnitude of benefit is not overwhelmingly large, right? So there's essentially a 20% relative risk reduction over two years, or 27 months, in the combined endpoint of cardiovascular mortality or hospitalization for heart failure, right? Real outcomes, hard outcomes. Um, and in each of those components, there's about a 3% absolute risk reduction about a 5% absolute risk reduction in the combined outcome, uh, but 3.2% absolute risk reduction in cardiovascular mortality, 2.8% absolute risk reduction in first hospitalization for heart failure, and 2.8% absolute risk reduction in all-cause all mortality, right? So real, um, and certainly with Pioneer, 
being published as well. I think there's sort of at least one more trial now that sort of demonstrates the plausibility of this. I think most people would agree it's a good drug. That's why I got a class one guideline indication for patients with HEFREF exceedingly quickly. And with regard to how it compares with other heart failure therapies, this isn't sort of the, the focus of this talk, but I think it's important to recognize it's right in line with the reduction that we've seen with other therapies. Uh, CRT probably actually probably has the bit, the biggest benefit in terms of just magnitude, um, but you know it's it's similar uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of benefit uh, that we've seen uh, with other therapies that we all agree are important and part of guideline recommendations. I think it's interesting that it's priced almost exactly at fifty thousand dollars per quality adjusted life year for those of you who do or have any familiarity with cost effectiveness analysis, $50,000 per quality is what was set largely by dialysis. Um, and I think it's fascinating that the list price of Entresto essentially hits $50,000 exactly per quality, and I suspect that's no accident. Again, that has to do with coverage decisions, has nothing to do with how patients think about this. But it's interesting that there has been lower, expe lower than expected utilization uh, of Secubitril Valsartan. Um, some of this is predictable. There's a, often a lag time of 10 to 15 years uh, before things really ramp up um, after a new drug is introduced. But this has been slower than what most people have thought would be the case, given the fact that this is really considered kind of a game changer drug and the first new drug uh, for heart failure in quite some time to have this kind of impact. It's always an interesting thing when you have to do this little inset diagram to, to, to shrink the y-axis. That's always like a red flag for me to, to, to show that the benefit may not be, or, or that the change may not be quite as much as you want. But it does show clearly that um, you know, there's an uptick. Um, but, it, but if you look at the, the, big, the bigger picture, um, obviously it's still a relatively low percentage of people on this drug, despite the fact this is of people who seem to be at least at an administrative level eligible for the drug. So you have very low uh, uptake. So there's lots of potential reasons. Like I said, there's often low uptake of drugs after uh, they're introduced to the market. But certainly, cost is cited as a potential reason for concern about this drug. Right? All the other medical therapies for heart failure fall into the $5 a month bucket. Right? This one is notable for not being that case. Evabradine is the same, but Evabradine doesn't have um, the same indication and certainly doesn't have the same uh, evidence of mortality benefit. So I think cost is certainly a piece of why this is a difficult decision. So the list price, as I mentioned, is a little over $4,500 a year. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, it sort of really meets, it's right at the traditional cost effectiveness threshold. But I think the interesting th issue when we think about interacting with our patients is what they would pay the pharmacy. So this just shows, and again, don't, don't focus on the specific numbers. I just want you to see a range. This is from Part D plans. So you can go on the Medicare website, and you can essentially link to Part D plans and figure out what people pay um, uh, per month. Um, and you can see a pretty big range, everything from sort of 60 bucks uh, up to, I don't know how you pay 465 when the list price would actually be about 380 So how, you, how it gets inflated is really interesting. Um, but at any rate, this was, this was just from a look about a year ago when we put together this grant. Um, so it's an appreciable, uh, appreciable amount of money per month. I will say many, uh, there are Part D plans with very low co-pays as well. Um, those have come down a bit. Um, and importantly, Medicare patients have typically not been eligible for drug assistance programs, and that's for intentional reasons, uh, largely because co-pays are not considered accidental. So why is this one hard, right? So we mentioned some of these. Good alternatives exist, right? There's a guideline recommendation present, so it's not a kind of toss-up decision about whether to take the drug. The benefit is real, but it's not what I would call overwhelming. The cost is significant, but it's also not overwhelming. This isn't as expensive, for example, as PCSK9 inhibitors. It's not as expensive as some of these tremendously expensive cancer chemotherapy, chemotherapeutics. Um, unfortunately, we don't know a lot and certainly can't assume a lot about patient values or finances or the trade-offs they would be willing to make. And I won't talk in detail about it, but I think it's particularly a complex decision for African-American patients because they were highly underrepresented in Paradigm HF. And not only were they underrepresented, but there's a class one indication for uh, 
hydralazine isosorbide that wasn't accounted for in Paradigm HF. So how those two interact is a, is a really problematic issue. So we've tried to answer some of these questions. Um, and I want to show you this, uh, uh, some of our data. So um, what we did, and I don't know why this looks wavy. We'll just say the picture that we used didn't have wavy smiley faces. Um, but this was a study uh, that we did last year um, in clinics at Emory and St. Joseph's where we showed people the information from Paradigm HF and we used these pictographs. Uh, and this, we essentially showed them three sets of pictographs and had a lot of back and forth. Uh, so Andy's son Graham did a lot of these interviews so he, uh, I can just attest to the fact there was a lot of back and forth to get people to sort of explain what the, or get people to understand what the uh, study showed. This is the most complex set of pictographs. One just showed mortality benefit, one just showed hospitalization, and we did, because we wanted to try to be true to the trial, add the one that shows them both. So this is the one that shows them both. Essentially, the red is people who died, the yellow is people who got hospitalized, the yellow and red are people who had both of those things happen, and then the green were the people who did well. Right. So we essentially showed them these scenarios and then asked them a few questions. One, do they find the benefit important? Would they want to take the medicine? Second, if it was $5 a month more than their current medicine, would they want to take it? Third, would they want to pay $100 a month more uh, to do that? We did then ask them if the answer to that was no, um, how much would you want to pay? We were asking everybody how much they would want to pay. But many people who said they would be willing to pay $100 would then say, well, I want to pay $15. They weren't, going to get, they, they weren't getting that question, so we tossed it. Um, uh, and then we asked a little bit about how they wanted their providers to talk with them about cost and what some of their experiences were. We're, just, we're, we're still analyzing a bit of those data. But this study, which is, which is impressed at Jaha, um, I think really is interesting. So just to go through the population, so we interviewed 50 people. Um, there was one audio failure. So um, so we lost the recording, but basically 49 people in this uh, population. As you can see, it's pretty representative of the heart failure population at our clinics. The median age was 57, 43% um, female, 41% African American, 39% high school or less education with pretty good representation of sort of some college and then college graduates and above. 37% uh, with uh, income less than 25,000 and pretty evenly distributed between less than 25,000, 25 to 100, and more than 100,000. Um, health literacy was assessed using a one question screen about comfort filling out medical forms, it's a pretty standard tool. About 60% basically state, were defined as having high health literacy just based on comfort filling out medical forms. 20% um, uh, were currently taking Secubitrol Valsartan. We intentionally included some folks who were on the drug and made that decision. Um, and 49% that uh, sort of self assess their health as good or better. So, um, so here are the data to the three core questions. So the first, assuming you're taking a drug like lisinopril, we did use lisinopril rather than enalapril just because more of our patients are familiar with that drug. Um, and we used the brand name of Entresto just because Arnie is entirely unfamiliar and Secubitril Valsartan is a tremendous mouthful to try to get out every time you describe. Um, and we didn't want, some folks have asked us what, whether this was a problem. We actually were fine with the idea that people were associating this with the brand um, because that was likely what they brought to the table anyway. Um, so, uh, so, right, so 72% um, basically answered definitely or probably yes to the first question, which importantly did not include anything about whether the doctor had recommended the drug. It was just literally looking at these pictograms, would you want to take it? The second question said, based on your current health expenses and income, if Entresto costs $5 a month more than your current medication, would you want to change your current medication if your doctor recommended it? Right, so we wanted to make sure to get the re medical recommendation piece in there. And 92% of people um, essentially answered that they would want to take the drug. Then we asked them to imagine if it were $100 a month and their doctor recommended it. Um, and that went down to 43%. So a pretty big change based on a change in copay from $5 to $100 a month. Again, both entirely within the range of what people currently pay for this drug. <clears throat> we did look at it, particularly with the $100 response, by patient characteristic. And I won't go into these in any great detail, except to say, essentially, within every substratum that you can come up with, whether it's income, education, race, 
or five-year health status, there was a substantial number of people who decided they wouldn't want to take this drug at $100 a month. We also looked at, um, in terms of how people uh, approached the decision, these were highly interactive interviews. They were about 30 minutes long. It wasn't a survey. Um, and so we did some qualitative analysis looking at the way people approach the decision. And this is, I think, incredibly important and I suspect probably resonates with your clinical experience. So some groups of, some patients would engage in what I would describe as a very traditional cost-benefit analysis, right? As exemplified by the quote, because $100 is just too much for medicine, isn't it? It's not that much difference in the charts, two or three people out of 100. Basically, $100 is a lot. That doesn't look like a huge difference. That doesn't seem worth it. Some people engage in what we call the straight cost analysis, right? Just off a of budget, right now I'm paying, what I'm paying is high. With my co-pays to do an increase definitely wouldn't work being on disability. Not an assessment that is not worth it, just an assessment that I can't pay that. Other people sort of had what we called the health above all, right? If it was $1,000 a month or something outrageous, I'd probably have to really think about it because you know in a year that's really gonna add up. But at the end of the day, if it's something that can save your life, there's no price. Other people just entirely went on what the doctor said. I don't believe the mass results necessarily relate to any one given person. Um, I put more faith in the opinion of my own doctor, so they didn't really, they didn't, they didn't feel comfortable with the idea of trying to extrapolate from a trial to them, uh, and they trusted the person that they talked to. Um, and other people had what we noticed, and, and this is in two different categories, total status quo based reasoning, right? If it's working, you know, like I said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So that applied interestingly, both to people who assess their current health status as good and people who assess their current health status as really bad. So the really good people, we expected the really bad people would be fired up to make a change. Turns and the really good people, you can understand why they might not want to rock the boat. Turns out neither one of them, well, some portion of both categories want to avoid rocking the boat. The really bad people, because they feel like if you rock a boat that's about to sink, that's a bad idea. Um, so it was interesting that, that we saw a very status quo based kind of reasoning on both sides of this. So I think it's really important to recognize that people use information very differently, think through these kinds of trade-offs very differently across a population. So I think the big picture findings from that small study um, are that cost clearly turns this into a preference sensitive decision. I think that's hard to argue, right? You can look at order effects. There's lots of different ways we could have presented this. But the fact is, you saw a change from 92% to 43%. It's hard to argue people really don't care about that. Um, Cost sensitivity is really relevant across a range of co-payments. The median suggested price among the people who said no to the $100 scenario, their median sort of amount they were willing to pay when they told us was about 15 bucks. Um, so even at less than $100, there's still gonna be some people who um, may not find it worth it. Uh, and it doesn't isolate to low-income patients, which I think is important. Um, integrating costs, particularly in light of very different ways of approaching decisions is incredibly complex. And what I think is really humbling is there's real problems if people either underappreciate the benefits of the drug, right? So the guy who just dismisses two or three out of 100 as being meaningless is potentially problematic. Similarly, someone who says, look, there's more greens in that. Anything with more greens, I'd do anything for, right? That's bad too. Um, so they're both real challenges. So hopefully throwing in the towel is not, uh, is not what we do. And what I want to talk to you about is um, a little bit about where we're going from here. Because hopefully we uh, will be able to provide some valuable answers. So, um, so this is a project that recently got funded um, and that we're just starting up now. Uh, and I'll just let you know what we're doing because I, uh, you know, I think it's a really interesting study and involves um, some pretty cool techniques. So the first piece um, that we're going to do is try to figure out in community practice, how are these discussions happening? Um, so there's a group called Verilog that, uh, largely under contract from industry, records conversations that occur between um, uh, patients and physicians. And we have access to about 400 uh, recorded encounters where Secubitril Valsartan is discussed. So we'll look uh, within those conversations at whether cost is discussed, how it's discussed if it is, um, how the benefits are framed, um, and the impact of those factors on the decisions because we have data about whether they decide to take the drug or not. So at a population level, it'd be interesting to get a sense of sort of how these conversations are and aren't happening. The second piece of the project uh, is an attempt to try to uh, 
um, optimized communication strategies about it. Um, and this is a follow-up study um, to the one that, uh, to Graham's paper, um, is uh, really trying to understand how they view the decision and the trade-offs it involves. And what we're doing is, a, again, a qualitative study at the University of Colorado and here, using a decision aid that's been created by the University of Colorado under contract uh, 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 with the ACC for their CardioSmart platform. We want to understand how people think about this, as well as to try to pare down a four-page decision tool um, to a one-page thing that could be more helpful in practice. This just so shows a snapshot of their tool. Um, and that is available if you guys have folks um, uh, that are interested in this. It's kind of long, so it's not really easily used in an office-based setting. But if people want to read about the drug, it's a nice distillation of the drug for people. Um, one component of it, sort of, this is just a, a, to show you what it looks like, is this uh, uh, similar pictographs to what we use, sort of describing the mortality benefits associated with Secubitril Valsartan compared to ACE. It's interesting, we, everybody has struggled with how to call, how, how to describe this, whether you describe it as Secubitril Valsartan, Arnie, and Tresto. Um, it's, it's, a really interesting, uh, it's a really interesting problem that feels like it shouldn't have to be a problem, but it is. Um, and I'll highlight the bottom right, right? So there's this statement, compared to other medicines, this is actually a pretty big benefit. They put this in, and I think actually it's incredibly thoughtful, um, because they got feedback from patients and doctors that they were really worried about potential underestimation of the value of this drug. Our next, I mentioned that because our sort of subsequent phase is gonna be using some online tools to essentially do randomized experiments, a lot like what was done with the Palm study, with different presentations of this information to try to get a sense of what the stakes are in terms of how we frame it. Right? So one piece is absolute versus relative risk. A second could be different displays of data using pictograms versus bar graphs. Um, and then the third is uh, you know, whether or not things like this box make a difference to whether people want to take the drug. Um, similarly, I think it's incredibly important to understand whether we mention it, what, whether mentioning the guideline indication for this drug sort of hijacks decisions such that if someone says it's a guideline, they're just going to do it no matter what, or whether that um, is something that makes a more uh, moderate effect on people's decisions, or whether it doesn't affect it at all. Obviously, the answer to all those experiments doesn't answer the big question about what the right way to frame these decisions is. But one of the biggest problems is half the time when we talk to patients, we don't know what the impact uh, of, of how we describe things uh, will be. And at least will provide us with some guidance about where we're, where we're shooting. The last piece of this project is what I'm probably most excited about, which will be a step wedge trial, which is a tool that's it's a version of a cluster design, where we'll actually make patient-specific cost available at the time of the clinical encounter. Um, and understand what that, and we'll get to learn uh, what that does to conversations, how that affects choices, how that affects short-term adherence, um, and, uh, and, and um, there are rates of prescriptions, choice of therapy. So in summary, um, I think this is probably obvious, but hopefully I've at least communicated that out-of-pocket cost is relevant. It clearly matters to patients, and I think considerations of financial toxicity are real. Um, some of the policy level efforts that are in play to increase transparency, I think will certainly affect our interactions with patients, right? If price is always mentioned at the end of ads, we're gonna hear about that when people um, come to, to, to see us. Um, the effects of those policy level efforts are far from clear. These affect a broad range of drugs within cardiology. Um, I think how we communicate about cost certainly matters. And integrating cost is incredibly complex, but um, I think it's really problematic that we don't know much about how to do it. Um, and then I thought I'd leave with sort of the glass half full, glass half empty kind of slide. So, because um, I think it's important to address. So some of you may be in the pessimist side, right? That this issue's not going away. Drug prices are too big of a problem for us to make progress in this way. It's true this issue is not going away. Um, the policy level efforts are clearly not driven by evidence. That's abundantly true. Um, these, you know, things like disclosure of price uh, 
I will say that the, the potential impact of that on behaviors um, has not been carefully evaluated. There's been several coverage decisions. I would argue that the requirements for shared decision making for EP procedures recently also were good examples of policy level efforts to promote engagement in decisions that were made without any evidence about the impact of those decisions or de uh, those structures on patients' decisions. And so that, from, uh, that is, I think, grounds for some pessimism. One issue that I think is really important, um, and again, this was mentioned last week, Tracy Wong described the Artemis trial where they essentially covered people's co-pays for Ticagrelor, uh, and Larry asked a question about the MI Free study, which was looking at similar uh, access to medicines post-MI. They haven't seen huge impacts on health outcomes with reducing costs. And you could say, well, everything related to cost you know, doesn't make a huge difference. There's other drivers of behaviors. There's questions about whether these have all been sort of fully maximized. The bigger issue, though, is I'd say those have not looked at outcomes like we're trying to look at, which is kind of alignment with people's, people's values, financial toxicity concerns. There are other kinds of reasons for involving people effectively in cost discussions that have nothing to do with simple uh, questions of adherence or even health outcomes. So I think um, it, those things are true and they're humbling, uh, but I don't think that eliminates the importance of dealing with cost. In terms of reasons for optimism, um, so I obviously fall in this category, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this project. Um, but the information barrier is going to go away. It's true there are lots of companies right now who are working to contract with payers to be able to effectively integrate patient-specific out-of-pocket cost into the EHR. So when you go to, to write a prescription for Secubitril Valsartan <coughs> within some relatively defined period of time, you will be able to know what that patient would pay. Um, so that's coming, and I think we need to know how to use that information, and we need to know what the impact is gonna be. The processes for communication can be studied, right? We can learn the difference or the impact of how we frame uh, decisions on people's behavior. And even if that information doesn't answer what we should do, it at least gives us the information we need to know what we are doing. Um, I think it's clear patients can participate in this, right? Patients don't always have, um, uh, you know, the big picture kind of health data uh, knowledge that we do, but they do know what money means to them. Um, and they're the only people who know what money means to them, and we can't necessarily make progress without engaging them. And I think in many ways, this may be in a, in a well, in a small way, uh, part of a more, uh, a potentially productive dialogue about notions of value um, and about incorporating cost into healthcare decisions in ways that we all, I think, know are important. So I, I do owe some thanks to uh, colleagues at several places, certainly to Alana, uh, Miranda Moore, who's a health economist in family medicine, Graham Smith, who worked uh, really hard uh, uh, interviewing these patients in heart failure clinic, Candace Bate and Andrea Mitchell for my research team. Uh, Larry Allen and Dan Matlock at University of Colorado have become great collaborators. Um, Peter Ubel at Duke, uh, Scott Halpern at Penn. Sapria Shore, one of our former fellows, uh, was instrumental in getting this project going um, and has continued to be involved since her departure to Michigan um, and certainly to funders as well. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. It was always a great talk. I, I'll give you a comment and a question. The first comment is I, I agree that information barrier for the physicians is huge, right? I mean, because we really don't. And, you know, right now our EHR flags up some sort of level yeah. thing and no one really knows what that yeah. means and it's not specific for patients. So I think that's going to be key. The, the second is I just want to challenge you a little bit on the Entresto one because you know, the other factor there is these patients are also tired of taking a zillion pills, right? So the heart failure patients, you know, what's the average number of medications a heart failure patient is on? Ten, like 10 or 12, yeah. something like that, yeah. And, and so would it be different for someone getting their first ever long-term medication? You know, would it be a different story then? Because, I mean, my own experience, I, I actually started someone on that medication a couple of weeks ago, and he said, oh, guys, doc, you know, a couple years ago, you started me on this spironolactone stuff. Now, you know, every year you're going to add something new, you know, and that was a patient who wasn't paying out of yeah. pocket is a, from a, another yeah. institution that's federally funded, as yeah. they say, and uh, or had a small copay. Yeah. And so I, th I think that's another kind of yeah. complexity to the Entresto story yeah. and, and does, you know, that sort of alter the, the financial component. Yeah. So um, 
with regard to so, right with, the, with regard to the information barrier, I think that is tremendous. I do think that's going to be overcome, um, and and probably overcome at a very granular level. The folks who are working on this would even include things like where you are with regard to the deductible, donut hole, those kinds of things are. That's within striking distance, I suspect. So one of the arguments for our proposal was, yeah, we're going to have to get patient-specific out-of-pocket costs by brute force. We've got had to allocate appreciable funds to make that happen. Um, but but that's in anticipation of this being done at a much different level. Yeah, with regard to the your your latter question, I would say there's, there's sort of two issues. One is. Those are different contexts that are meaningfully different, right? Starting a patient on their first medicine versus starting a patient on their 10th medicine is a different setting. And we may have different conversations and different barriers with patients in different contexts. So, so I think that's, um, that's clearly important and one that we need to understand. Um, and and the, the nature of the proper discussion may be different in, in different ones. In terms of the interest specific decision, um, you know, I, I, I guess I would say it is replacing a medicine that most people are on. So, so whether whether a barrier is the newness of it or the fact that it feels like one more medication and one more kind of drop in the bucket, I don't know how much that's a, a, a barrier. The short answer is one of the things that we'll learn from our al analysis of dialogues is that we're we're getting anytime it's mentioned. So we're searching. We're, we're able to search through transcripts rather than through prescription patterns. So we'll get a sense of whether part of the barrier is that people just like, oh, doc, you know, this is one more thing, I can't deal with it. Um, so we'll find that out. Um, but in terms of burden, other than the fact that it's not, you know, it, the frequency issues obviously are relevant, um, but it is a replacement medicine. So I don't know that it, I don't know how much that is actually operationalized. If, if any of our heart failure colleagues have thoughts about that, I'd, I'd be interested. Yeah. So, Neil, within this, it's also the issue of what truly is shared decision making. Yeah. And, you know, it's something that I'm trying to learn, struggling with. It's not just giving somebody That's right. information. It's sort of aligning yourself, understanding the patient's desires and the barrier that they face, and then how do decisions face into that. And this, um, my wife's a fertility specialist and you know the issue of um, females who are over age 35 where their eggs are becoming older and how soon do you go to advanced reproductive technologies where costs are within that and it's very interesting talking to her the differences in approach of physicians yeah. and how they frame things or how it's discussed in the ultimate decision and whether somebody actually stays in a practice and gets pregnant or leaves the practice it's it's highly variable across their their field and um, and the biases that um, physicians may have around whether somebody is going to pay something or not pay something or um, but just I, I think all of this makes us rethink that we do need to understand what our patients are dealing with, um, how they value things, and probably that connectivity overall becomes even more important than the 3% difference that's seen over a two-year mm -hmm. period of time. By engaging in those conversations, I think we become better physicians. Yeah. So. yeah, and I think, so, so the other thing I would add to, so I agree with everything you said, the other, the other thing I would add, and I probably didn't say it explicitly enough, is there's often a notion that shared decision making means sort of throwing it in the lap of patients um, and just throwing out information. And that's exactly what I think would be the wrong approach to, to most of this, right? So I think that one of the reasons I was interested in the Secubitra of Alsartan scenario is there's a guideline recommendation for a reason, right? It's a, it's a good drug, it's beneficial. Our default in a properly selected patient um, unless you have reasons to think it's not the right drug for a patient for medical reasons, our default should probably be to have people take this drug. Um, and so if we have ways of framing that mean that 20% of people decide to take this drug, either A, we've got a lot of questions to ask about what the barriers are that we don't know about, or, or we're framing it in ways that really aren't setting people up for a good decision. Um, and so I think uh, this is 
there's a real marriage of sort of behavioral economics and respect for autonomy that I don't think are um, incompatible. Um, and I think the, the key is that as, as clinicians, the biggest thing is we need to know the impact of what we say and make those choices. I talk to the residents a lot about this with regard to life in the CCU, where, you know, an end of life discussion with a family, you, you need to have an idea of what you think um, the likely most reasonable choice is for that patient when you walk in the room and discuss it in a way like that. That's different from overriding their autonomy and telling them what they are going to do or what you are going to do. But if you don't have an idea of what you think the, the, the most reasonable or most likely reasonable choice is, you may frame it in a way that, that absolutely steers it the wrong direction and that isn't steering it in a way that's consistent with their values. Yeah. This is very important stuff. Uh, it occurs to me that I've never really known what the cost to patients was, yeah. and I guess this is the point you're making. My question is, who currently has the discussion with patients about cost? Is it more likely the physician or the pharmacist? Almost. And, and, and the question yeah. about the pharmacy is, is your research dealing anywhere with uh, the pharmacy. That's a, so that's a great question. So the answer to the second question is easier, and that's no. So we're not we're not tackling the pharmacy discussion. But obviously, um, <clears throat> I think you, your your inclination is right that in many cases, um, you know, some of you guys I've talked to this uh, about what your practice is um, in the CCU. I don't usually have this dilemma, um, but uh, but I think in many cases. The practice will be, we recognize this may be expensive. We don't know exactly what this is going to be for you. These are the potential tools with regard to drug assistance programs and, and whatnot. Give us a call if you, when you get to the pharmacy if it becomes too expensive. Right? So one of the problems is it gets fragmented. Right? I think people trying to be thoughtful, sometimes the best they can do is to say, if, if it's the case that when you get there it's too expensive, either don't, don't fill it or give us a call and we'll try to work out an alternative. So most of, often that happens at the moment they hit the pharmacy. The problem is there's not much opportunity for a discussion at that point because that's not the person who prescribed the drug. So, um, so in today's system, often that is a place of breakdown. Yeah. Uh, Larry. Uh, <laughs> Power what, of the mic. What you, what you just said, uh, Neil, about uh, give us a call it's extremely difficult for yeah. that to take place. That's right. You know, my brother happens to be a pharmacist in Griffin. He, one of the last that owns his own drugstore. One time I asked him, I said, what about that Eckerd's down the way? He says, see, I love it. Because they bounce off there. Yeah. They have a generic to... pharmacist. Yeah. Uh, what gets us in the clinic is if uh, a patient comes in taking Entresto. Yeah. And they were given samples. Yeah. Then, then they're about to give out. They want that prescription. Yep. Bam. Yep. <laughs> That's an issue. So, uh, of course, we don't give out samples, but I guarantee you, everywhere else they give yep. them out. And the the uh, drug There's reps. Fill them, yeah. Fill them, fill them, right. fill them full of uh, samples. Then we yeah. have to like adjudicate that. Yeah. Uh, the right pharmacist will adjudicate that also when he encounters that prescription. Yeah. And. Uh, so it depends on where they go. Yeah. But they, they get to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist starts calling you. I can't tell you how much time that takes to get yeah. that separated out. That's right. Larry. One last question. Adding to what uh, Spencer and Steve said about engaging um, our, a team approach to care, I think for specialized drugs like Entresto or PCSK9 inhibitors, you know, we are still relying on the 15-minute office visit yep. as the venue to have these clinician-patient shared decision-making discussions, which is not realistic. And so as you think further about your, your research yep. approaches, whether you would look at that approach versus a systems-based approach where you had a team, a PharmD, a case manager, and, and really interfacing maybe with the patient's pharmacy, and, and that might be a a fairer venue to 
to have these conversations and depict them. Um, and also in the, in the pictograms as well, I mean, those give us population-based yep. senses, but, but among patients, there might be quite a variation in where they, their individual pictogram, how that might look. Yep. And then the last comment is in our 2018 uh, cholesterol guidelines, these were the first guidelines to have um, two recommendations that were cost value recommendations. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, that'll be the standard in, in all of our guidelines. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And with that, we'll thank you and uh, wish everyone a happy holiday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.